Present. Councilor Bertain. Present. Councilor Bertain. Here. Councilor Bertain. Here. Mayor Powers. Here. Uh, any reporting back on the um, special meeting? Um, Mayor and Council Members, the City Council is in closed session this evening. Conference with Legal Counsel existing litigation, and there's nothing to report out of closed session. Thank you. Now we're going to have a silent prayer and flag salute by Pack 84 Cub Scouts. We will have two Dan six. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Color guard attention. Will the audience please rise? Salute. Color guard advance. Color guard. Prepared to post colors. Post colors. Please follow me into the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and the visible, and liberty and justice for all. Two. Color guard dismissed. Audience, please be seated. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> and this, would you please read the video statement? <clears throat> this meeting of the Galt City Council is being videotaped in its entirety and will be cable cast without interruption on Metro Cable 14, the Government Affairs Channel, on the Comcast and SureWest cable systems. Tonight's meeting can be seen on Channel 14 and will also be webcast at www.saxmetrocable.tv this Friday and Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. Tonight's meeting can also be seen via live video streaming on the city's website at www.ci.golf.ca.us. A DVD copy is also available for checkout from any library branch. Members of the audience wishing to address council should fill out a speaker identification form and give it to the clerk. Please speak into the microphone when addressing council and state your name for the record. Thank you. Council, is there any agenda approval, additions, or deletions? None? Okay. Um, okay. Now we're going to start off with the infrastructure report card from Mr. Winkler, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Um, the American Society of Civil Engineers has recently released its National Infrastructure Report Card. A similar report card was issued for the State of California's public infrastructure in 2012. Tonight's presentation will provide a brief, brief overview of those report cards and discuss the key infrastructure <laughs> I'll slow down the key infrastructure systems in the city of Galt. Uh, on the screen is a representation of the National Report Card just issued this uh, past month uh, by the National Society. And uh, this report card and backup details can be found for anyone who's interested on the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, website. And you can also find California's report card or that of the other 49 states uh, on that same website. Uh, this slide provides a summary assessment of 16 categories of public infrastructure that are deemed important to the national economic vitality and public safety and convenience. 
as you can see, uh, this is not a, re a stellar report card. Uh, the number of C's and D's are an indicator that once state-of-the-art facilities are falling behind uh, in meeting their capacity needs or are in an advancing state of deterioration uh, or are receiving insufficient invest investment to continue to reliably meet future needs. An explanation of each of these individual grades can be found, again, on the website. Um, it's an interesting read as to why they gave such low marks. Um, if you take the total estimated uh, funding needs nationally, uh, which is a roll-up of all the local cities, counties, states, uh, nationwide, uh, that estimated need um, by the year 2020 would be an investment of $3.6 trillion nationwide. And if you divide that by the national population of approximately 314 million people, uh, you get sort of an annual per capita investment needed. And that $3.6 trillion would be divided by eight years and then by that population figure to sort of give that. That gives us sort of a per person benchmark that we can then look at what the state report card and the local city infrastructure needs might be. Uh, this slide is the uh, depiction of the California report card, and it rates eight categories of vital California infrastructure, and obviously the national infrastructure needs are uh, vary by category with some of the local services provided. Uh, while the grades are better than the national average, they certainly are not going to move us to the front of the class either. Uh, four categories have shown improvement over the last six years. That's the the, the good news, uh, however, one category, water, uh, has actually received a lower grade, uh, meaning we've gone backwards in the past six years. Uh, as with the National Report Card, an explanation for each of California's grades can also be found on their website. Uh, they are indicating at the bottom of the right-hand 2012 column an annual investment need of $65 billion per year, and that was uh, uh, over the next 10 years that projected need would exist annually. And dividing by the state's population, um, you would get an annual unfunded investment need of $1,725 per person, which, uh, again, compared to the national amount, was approximately, and I've lost that page, <laughs> Uh, approximately uh, $1,434. So uh, Galt, needless to say, faces many of the same infrastructure challenges as do the state and the nation. Uh, we have aging water, sewer, and storm drainage systems. We have uh, aging city buildings. Um, and without adequate funding levels for ongoing maintenance, vital infrastructure systems will slowly fall into a state of disrepair and will be subject to reliability concerns and costly emergency repairs. However, with timely preventive maintenance, the total maintenance cost can be reduced over time and life expectancy can be increased. However, even with effective maintenance programs, all system components will eventually have to be replaced. Uh, and that's the, where most local municipalities and even counties in the state infrastructure tend to fall behind is we budget for immediate needs but nobody's putting aside money to eventually replace that dam or that airport or the railroad system or, in our case, miles and miles of pipelines and investments in libraries and parks uh, and roadway systems. So uh, a, a critical factor that uh, goes into long-term sustainability is having an asset replacement program built into your funding projections uh, over time. Uh, also, an effective infrastructure program needs to include funding for all three phases of asset management, uh, which includes short-term or immediate operating costs, ongoing preventive maintenance, and then, as I mentioned, future capital replacement costs. But age is not the only enemy. Ever-increasing regulatory requirements compete uh, for available funding uh, with our normal operating and maintenance and replacement costs. Compounding this uh, over the last few years have been the negative impacts of both uh, inflation and increasing fuel economy on fixed revenue sources such as fuel taxes, which are a fixed amount per gallon, even though cars are traveling two and three times the number of miles per gallon. So our effective purchasing power is cut by approximately two-thirds, and then uh, inflation continues to chip away at that fixed amount. Um, 
and of course we have reduced funding uh, related to the recession. There's reduced state and federal grant opportunities available, and uh, obviously reduced local discretionary funding through sales and property taxes. And these impacts ultimately lead combined to a need for increased user fees or alternative funding sources. I'm pleased to announce that as I come here, and I've been here a little over seven months now, and I'm looking at the various uh, works put together by your council, your city manager, and, and my predecessors, that a number of proactive steps have been taken that, that are actually quite impressive for a city the size of Galt. Um, you have uh, completed master plans uh, in 2010 for uh, to look at your 2030 general plan build-out needs for water, sewer collection, and storm drainage systems. In addition to long-range needs, each of those master plans also identified current deficiencies at, at the time they were done in 2010 and recommended short-term corrective action needed over the next two to ten years. Um, the city's pavement management system uh, was completed in a related condition assessment in 2011 and that provides a useful asset management tool going forward to help prioritize current and future pavement needs uh, and investment decisions. And then looking forward, uh, we're, we're well underway with a wastewater treatment facilities master plan. Uh, that's nearing completion. We have actually have a draft of it that we're circulating for comments now, and uh, we we'll plan to present that to the council within the next two to three months uh, uh, in a study session along with the environmental documents that would go with that, and we'll summarize for you some of those recommendations at that time. And we recently, in January, added a new objective to the city strategic plan, uh, which was to identify and prioritize deferred maintenance needs for the city's buildings, and we're in the process of working on that. And lastly, later this year, uh, we're working with uh, uh, human resources and staff to finalize an ADA transition plan, which is somewhat overdue for the city to talk about how we're going to um, meet the requirements of the American with Disabilities Act for uh, access or improved access to uh, city buildings, facilities, parks, and public right-of-way features such as uh, uh, access ramps, uh, sidewalks, and whatnot. So we're working on some things that are going to put the city in a good position to sort of project forward what our needs are. With that, I'd um, like to take a quick, give you a quick snapshot of the major infrastructure systems that those reports address. Um, your water system has approximately 100 miles of pipeline eight active wells, a number of decommissioned wells that are in emergency standby or decommissioned mode, and we're using five water treatment plants to, to address the various water needs within the city. Uh, the 2010 master plan identified two and a half miles of pipeline that either need to be upgraded or replaced uh, to meet fire flows within the city, particularly in the old town areas. Um, four wells are uh, expected to require maintenance or replacement maintenance, rehabilitation, or replacement over the next uh, eight years or so, and uh, three water treatment plants are going to require uh, rehabilitation and upgrades by 2020. Uh, together, those uh, asset needs are estimated at $29.4 million, and if you divide that by the eight years to 2020 and the current uh, city population, you get an approximate investment need for our water system of $103 per person per year. That's every man, woman, and child listed in Colts population. Similar snapshot of our wastewater collection system. We have 80 miles of pipelines ranging in size, uh, 12 pump stations to collect those areas and push it on down towards the treatment plant. Um, the 2010 master plan identified approximately almost 10 miles of pipeline that need replacement or upgrading uh, to handle deficient capacity needs. Five pump stations were identified to require replacement or rehabilitation. Uh, that um, actual that crystal ball was uh, truer than we like to uh, uh, acknowledge in that uh, we've actually got um, uh, two that are on sort of life support right now waiting for, we've done some emergency repairs and we're in uh, rapid design for both East Street and uh, Vintage Oaks uh, lift stations that uh, have actually had some failures that are going to require rehabil major rehabilitation. So we're moving those up on the priority list. Mm -hmm. uh, together, that's a uh, rec uh, recommended investment in over the next eight years of approximately 28.6 million, which would be approximately $149 per person in golf um, per year. Wastewater treatment plant, uh, again, we're at the final draft phase of a facilities master plan, and um, that uh, has identified uh, 
our current facilities. As you may know, your original plant was built out at the uh, uh, Twin Cities site uh, back in 1981. It was a very small plant. Uh, it was uh, it underwent a major upgrade of more than three times its capacity back in 1990, and then again in 2011 you completed a major upgrade of tertiary treatment uh, for both disinfection and solids handling. Um, we are up against, as we reported here several weeks back, uh, some regulatory deadlines uh, to do additional upgrades for nitrogen and arsenic removal and solids handling improvements to make sure we keep our three million gallon per day uh, rating capacity with our permit, and uh, it's projected that over uh, the next eight years that we're going to have to invest another $27.5 million or so just at the treatment plant, uh, which again would be another $143 per person per year over the next eight years of average cost. Uh, your storm drain system, about 70 miles of pipeline, one detention basin, rear basin, and two pump stations that make all that rainwater magically disappear after a big storm. Uh, but we do have a number of areas where we have deficient pipelines, about four miles, and uh, we're going to need to invest uh, some $7 million, um, and that would require another $37 per person per year over the next eight years. Your pavement management system indicates uh, or reflects uh, 89 center line miles. We've got some two lane roads, three lane roads, got some new interchanges um, uh, going in, which will be added to our pavement management system for future asset management. Uh, your current value in 2011, when the assessment was done, is that your roadway, public right of way uh, investment just in your pavement, doesn't count curbs and gutters, doesn't count drainage systems, is almost $180 million. That's probably your largest single investment. And the good news is that in 2011, the citywide rating was on average of a 76, which is considered good. Uh, you drop down to about a 70, you drop into the fair category, if you get below 60, you're going to be in the poor or um, uh, failing category if you get below 50. So right now we're okay, but to keep it there, uh, the 2011 assessment was that we need to, on average, invest $2.9 million a year just in pavement maintenance. It doesn't count new interchanges, doesn't count Twin Cities roundabouts. Those are major new capital upgrades uh, for future capacity. But just in the existing pavement, we need to spend, be spending approximately $2.9 million a year to keep that 76 rating. Otherwise, you slowly uh, drop down with deferred maintenance needs. Um, that the level of investment would be approximately $121 per capita per year. Historically, uh, over the last five or six years, the average expenditures on maintenance have been in the $400,000 rather than $2.9 million range. However, the last two years, we saw a significant increase with a major slurry, slurry CO and several overlay projects. Um, we're probably going to have to hold off another year with uh, the uh, Twin Cities roundabouts funding uh, uh, looming uh, large in the window here, but uh, we hope to get back to a, uh, an enhanced investment program over the out years uh, once we get past those large capital needs. So if we were to sort of roll all of that up, um, the uh, second column would be a recap of those uh, eight-year investment targets that were identified in your master plans of deficiencies, um, and that would total some $116 million or so uh, and $603 per person per year uh, over the next eight years. Uh, the right-hand two columns uh, are indication of what's uh, in the six-year capital improvement budget for fiscal years 11, 12 through 16, 17, and those aren't hard budgets, but they're projected uh, uh, wishful sort of uh, hope for spending. And you can see that we're falling well short of the, the necessary funding levels uh, on an annual basis. So we're going to need to step it up uh, uh, over the out years uh, and, and find creative revenue sources uh, to, to come up to that uh, recommended level. Um, in reality, what happens is we either will probably need to do some capital borrowing to spread costs out over more than a six-year or eight-year window. Uh, for instance, if we're going to invest uh, $28 million uh, in our sewer collection system or nearly $30 million in our water system, we'll probably look to get state or infrastructure bank loans that allow us to spread that out over 20 years, knowing that those assets will be valued at 20 or 30 or 40 year life expectancy. So uh, rather than uh, have to dramatically raise rates, we'll probably look to spread those costs out to our users over uh, for a reasonable horizon so we can get those annual costs to a manageable level. 
with that, uh, in conclusion, um, I think it would be premature, as I, I, I kiddingly refer to myself as the new kid on the block, but a little over uh, seven months in, uh, I think uh, what I'm seeing is the city's made a good start on looking to what are our needs and uh, how do we finish those asset uh, uh, management uh, studies that are still outstanding. We haven't let, looked at a comprehensive building facilities needs program. Uh, we haven't looked at what our park infrastructure needs might be over the long term. Um, we, by virtue of, of limited funding and we're in some difficult economic times, we've been forced uh, in our history to be reactive versus proactive. But I think that uh, your management team is trying to change that. Uh, I know that Mark Clarkson in the water and wastewater areas uh, were in the process as we speak of hiring uh, uh, some staff that will help us uh, turn the corner on doing some proactive preventive maintenance, hopefully extend our asset management life, uh, find some creative funding strategies to allow us to maybe do some needed backlog and deferred maintenance so that we can actually extend uh, our costs in the future. Uh, and to make uh, significant progress on the backlog of deferred maintenance, uh, we're going to have to make that transition and, and look at life cycle costs and short-term investments to extend or reduce those long-term costs. Uh, and that can only, of course, be accomplished with an adequate funding strategy, um, which is sort of the third leg of the asset management stool. I think it's, it's easy to identify needs and then to prioritize those needs. But then you have to figure out how we're going to pay uh, for all of that needed infrastructure. And uh, the old adage uh, that was famous on several ads was, uh, you, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. Uh, probably when you talk about infrastructure, probably the, the more correct adage would be, uh, you, can, you can pay me now or pay me a lot more later if we don't make strategic investments in a timely manner. And so I think part of the work that's cut out for, for, for me as your director and our management team is to to look for some funding strategies that uh, will be both sustainable but also affordable to the community. And uh, that's quite a tall order with some of these uh, uh, regulatory challenges ahead of us. But uh, I think it's doable. And uh, if you finally compare, um, let me back up a slide real quickly. If you compare uh, our uh, per capita need of $603 per person per year or um, uh, to the federal need or the state need uh, annualized amounts, uh, we're actually uh, looking pretty good compared to uh, some of our colleagues up and down the state and across the nation. So uh, uh, guarded optimism, I think that uh, we've got our work cut out for us, but we can uh, avoid some of the catastrophes we're seeing uh, in other communities, and I think we're well positioned for a community of our size. With that, I welcome any questions you might have. Council, comment or okay. questions? Um, we're hearing a lot from Washington about investing in infrastructure. Is there much hope in getting grant money from that direction? Well, I, I think everybody um, wants to talk about we need to invest. I don't hear too many people talking about where that money is going to come from. And obviously there's a partisan battle over do you reduce deficit or do you increase deficit? And, uh, uh, and how do you generate the revenues needed um, without postulating a, a political uh, referendum here. Um, I think that we need to invest as a nation and as local communities in our infrastructure. Uh, if we don't invest in a timely manner, the costs just continue to go up um, on the I think I just, uh, it's probably my cue to stop talking here when your name tag drops <laughs> off. But, um, the, um, uh, it, on the state infrastructure report card, uh, which is our third slide in, I don't know if you saw, but the uh, investment needs annually in the last six years have gone from, I believe it was 47 million to 65 billion, 47 billion annually to 65 billion uh, uh, in just six years, and that's deferred costs are making it more expensive. So it doesn't get any cheaper. And so uh, I think we're going to need to uh, buckle down and, and look for, for grants and loans and low interest situations, look to the developed community to help with future capacity and growth needs. But uh, we're going to have to uh, be looking at ourselves and our residents to figure out how we're going to fund uh, the local short term needs uh, to avoid having to raise rates uh, more dramatically in the future. Councilman Cruz is on his way to Washington, D.C. Maybe he can come back with a pot of money for us. Yeah. yeah. So, and you had, a, you had a comment. I have a right? laundry list of, of things that are needed. That's not done. Uh, quick question, Steve. Um, you said four wells, four wells require replacement rehabilitation. 
Is that above and beyond the, the additional high capacity well we're putting in? Well, actually, the, um, the, the cost well and the Golden Heights water treatment plants, uh, those were the needs as of 2010. And uh, as a result, my predecessors and, and your council uh, in the current CIP have approved those projects to move forward. Those address two of those needs. Um, uh, we've also got two wells that uh, uh, the cost well would be one of those new wells, and that would allow us to replace two existing wells uh, that, are, that are currently deficient or high in arsenic. And so uh, uh, that's part of the solution, but we've got three other wells that are aging and are going to need to be rehabilitated. Uh, new motors, new pumps, uh, screens uh, need to be uh, rehabilitated. So those are expensive processes. Typically um, on, the, on the larger high capacity wells, uh, that, could, that could be anywhere from $200,000 to $500,000 just to rehabilitate an existing well. And to sort of give you an example of uh, you don't, you know, right now we're sort of in a reactive run to failure mode. We're trying to turn that corner is uh, one of our largest producing wells at the industrial um, uh, uh, treatment site uh, uh, on the northwest corner of the city, um, we blew a 100 horsepower pump last week. That is one of the major water supplies for fire flow uh, for half the city. And so we were in an emergency PO mode. Thank goodness it didn't happen in July or August when demands are high. We're going to get that um, actually rebuilt. In the meantime, we're ordering a new motor. So we actually have four 100 horsepower pumps that are universally uh, can, can use the same motor. So what we're going to do is rebuild the existing pump and have that as a standby pump while we get the new pump in service immediately. Councilmember Singleton? Yeah, uh, just a comment, actually, because uh, maybe the public doesn't quite understand some of these. Because according to these, the grading system from the FTE, uh, sure doesn't look like we've done much, but something they have to understand is solid waste uh, and water legislation is continually changing. Solid waste are always changing rates, and and so we're almost like uh, uh, trying to keep up with uh, legislation and, and price increases. So I think that's partly why it may look like the water side of it we haven't done a whole lot, and it's just not true because we have really done a lot, especially here in Gulf, to uh, make sure that we are uh, in compliance with the water board regulations and uh, and actually done a very good job at it. So. It's, just the legislation yeah. is always changing. In the water and wastewater arenas for the city, uh, the major in those invest major investment categories were primarily to address regulatory requirements right. uh, that, that are fairly new in the last few years. Um, new permit requirements in 2015 for wastewater, uh, new, new arsenic requirements uh, on water treatment, and uh, those are driving some of the biggest dollar amounts. If you just were to look at our maintenance backlog, uh, those numbers would come way down in those two areas. I just want to make sure that the citizens understood that, that you know well, we are kind of trying to fight that. That was kind of brought up at our last <laughs> meeting. Um, Councilor Campion. Very good report. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Winkler. Steve, we appreciate that. So would you please read the public comment list? Under, under government code section 54954.3, members of the public may address the council on non-agenda items. Speakers may address council on any agenda item during consideration of the item. <coughs> Speakers shall restrict their comments to issues that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council and limit comments to a maximum of three minutes. Please select a speaker sheet located on the table inside the entrances to the council chambers and forward the completed spe speaker sheet to the city clerk. And I have no speaker sheet. Okay. Uh, Wait, we do have one. We do have one. She just hasn't brought her up yet. She doesn't want to interfere. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, you can come on up. Yeah. yeah. Don't sit You're down. Here. You're it. <laughs> Sherry Lund, for the record. What was the name again, please? Sherry Lund. Lund. Okay. Okay. Hi. Um, thank you for letting me speak. Um, this, I know that I was at a meeting a couple weeks ago and they talked about putting the dog park at Harvey. Um, I got a lot of our parents all wild up and so forth. Um, I just wanted to kind of quickly address some of the issues that were brought up um, with myself and one of the other, um, the other parents. The three things that we were interested in is one was the space at the dog park located in the trees on the west side of the field. 
Um, watching the games the last couple of weeks, that was an area that the teams do practice and warm up. Um, there were lots of parents that were over there. They use the pitchers during the actual game. They'll take the pitchers that are playing and move them over there, and they throw the ball with going back and forth as well. Um, I had some pitchers in the parking. They do use all four sides of the field for parking, and they include it goes down the street in both directions. Um, so that was an issue as well as having an additional structure there that would have a little more problems. Um, the games are scheduled September through November for the winter ball season, and then during the spring season, practices will start as early as February, but the games go March through June, and then our all starts go June to the middle of July. So that's the time period that we would be using the field. Um, as far as spectators on the field, most of the spectators sit closer to the dugouts and just past the dugouts where they can see in. Um, they do, there was a couple families that sat on the far side, all the way to the back, there's a fenced off area. A few of them sat there. Um, what I did notice is that there were several teams that sat by the trees on the western side while having the little meetings and so forth before the games, or the teams that just finished the games on Saturdays would meet over there. So that was something that, as well in the same space. Um, safety was brought up last, the last meeting. About, unfortunately, all of our players are not major league yet, and the balls tended to travel all sorts of different directions. Um, there are several balls hit over in that same area. Um, the kids use it for warm-up, and even in warm-up, you're really not safe even behind the bleachers. So it's kind of a free for all watching. Um, the other issue that was brought up is that there are a lot of stray dogs at the park that are there at the games, and there might be a conflict with having the dog park with dogs that are, you know, being held responsible by their owners and then dogs that tend to roam. Um, there are several families that bring their dogs to the ballpark. So there is an issue of having lots of dogs with lots of kids, um, even though the kids that are at the games are supervised and so forth, but there are a lot of their younger siblings kind of run around and play. So that was an issue brought up by my one of the other parents is that there'd be lots of dogs and kids in the one area. Uh, not the kids in the dog park, but the surroundings. Um, they also, one of the board members brought up, um, actually it was another man in the audience brought up the distraction of having a cute little dog run around and one of the younger boys supposed to be watching for fly balls and actually watching the dog. So we have to make sure they're not picking flowers out there and watching airplanes in the sky. So having little dogs run around would be a distraction. Um, the other thing was we brought up was the safety and how we've been there, and I've been there personally when there's been the drug deals that happen. Um, they usually happen on, well, the ones I've seen have all been on the western side. Um, they're not, they don't tend, I've I'm never sorry, seen Sorry, your yeah. time's up. Oh, sorry. There, our I cameras aren't working, but I, was, I know. Uh, uh, they aren't working for whatever. I did want to uh, thank, thank you for coming up. I wanted to let you know that on the agenda later on, there was hope that we're going to form a committee for that, and um, then we can give, if you have it written down, that would be great, and we could give it to the committee, or you can come and speak to the committee about your concerns when we work on it, but that's farther down on the agenda where the Planning Commission uh, has referred us to Not possibly yet. have, uh, Parks and Rec, I'm sorry, to possibly have a um, committee to look into it. I think that's a good idea to mention that at the last meeting. So you since, we're, since we're on the subject, do you want to just move that item up and then she'll know where where we're at with it? Do we want to do this? Okay, we're going to move that up so you can know what we're going to do with it. Um, okay? Armando will give us a Okay, Armando? You're on sooner than later, mister. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. At the March 5th, uh, 2013 City Council meeting, a staff report was submitted to Council regarding two options for a dog park located at Harvey Park to honor Officer Kevin Ton. At that meeting, Council directed staff to present these options to the Parks and Recreation Committee for their input. At the March 13th Commission meeting, members of the public expressed concerns regarding the Harvey Park locations due to safety issues, possible vandalism, and the close proximity to the site of Officer Ton's death. With those comments in mind, uh, the Commission voted 3-0 for City Council to appoint two Council members to work with two Parks and Rec Commissioners to explore options, locations for a memorial and or dog park for Officer Tom 
including additional community input. I'd be glad to answer any questions this council may have. Any questions, council? I guess it's pretty self-explanatory, correct? Well, I just had a quick question on the recommendation. Is it, is it the recommendation that the committee would provide direction or direction back to council? Or recommendations back to council? Oh, well, I'm sure it would come back to council. I would, I would absolutely say so, yeah. The recommendation doesn't read that way. Yeah. Okay, do we, we want to? Would, would, the committee would provide direct, looks as though it would provide direction to staff. Okay, and then it would come back to City Council if you'd like to add that to us. Yeah, that would be my only recommended change and come back to the Council. Okay, Armando. Okay. Um, Mayor, just to clarify, if you if you went along with the recommendation, what the Council would be doing would be forming an ad hoc committee um, composed of two Council members that you would appoint. There would be two additional uh, members that would be appointed by the Parks and Rec Commission. And... Um, if you wanted to designate a timeline for them to provide a report back to council, you could certainly do that. But the ad hoc committee would be tasked with uh, coming up with a recommendation that would come back to this body for uh, final action. Okay. Is that all right with everyone? Yeah. Uh, I just want. To, I just want to ask a couple questions. Uh, it was Miss Lund. Yeah, Is that correct, yeah. Lundy? I'm sorry. Uh, when you noticed, is somebody, you see the drug dealing going on over there? How long does it take the police to get there? Get there? Are you guys calling police when you see this going yeah. on? Okay. Okay. So I would hope so. Yeah. Uh, but we have an issue. We have to address another different issue. Uh, my my only uh, I, I don't have any issue with this. I just wanted to get this out on the table. Is people are concerned? I've heard from crime going on over in that area. We have crime all over the city, but they seem to try to centralize it there at Harvey Park. And yes, I agree that there's some stuff that goes on over there. Um, if we do not do something about it, if we just keep letting this crime keep going and going and going, it's going to keep building and building and building. Because one of the excuses I'm hearing from some folks is that, well, we don't want to park in that area because there's too much crime. Uh, we, we need to take our parks, like we've done with some of our neighborhoods in the city, and take them back. We can't allow this to happen. The, the parks in your neighborhoods belong to all of us. So, you know, we need some people to make sure we take some of this back because we keep letting it go and go and go and go. It's just going to keep building, building, building. Okay, so, but that's, I understand. Okay. Just get my. I know. I know. I was just saying. <laughs> you know, I am. Okay. I'm sure, people hear me. We just can't be letting this keep going. Um, what? Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. <clears throat> Um, if I could just make a couple of comments before you call the roll. Um, basically, what you'd be doing, as I indicated, is forming an ad hoc committee. There's been times in the past when we formed an ad hoc committee with just the council members. And when you do that, um, a committee of just two council members is not subject to the Brown Act. The committee as proposed, which includes uh, Parks and Rec Commissioners would in fact be a committee that would be subject to the Brown Act. So if you form the committee as proposed with those four members, um, then it would be subject to the Brown Act. They'd have to uh, prepare an agenda for their meetings and uh, and, and make it a uh, noticed noticed uh, public meeting. Okay, well, and then what's the alternative? What's the, instead of doing it that way, is there another way you could do it or make it a committee or? You have to have one, one, one and one. one. Well, I mean, I mean, the way, another way, if, if the issue is, I'm just making you aware that it would be a Brown Act committee. The other option is to uh, form a, a subcommittee of two council members, and they could uh, just seek input from Parks and Rec Commissioners and other members of the community, but they're not actually members of the committee. I don't think it's a problem. I'm just telling you that that's, I don't that's know the that, process. I, I, 
I don't think there's going to be that many meetings, are there? I, I wouldn't think there would be a whole two or three. Yeah. Meetings. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and then, I, then I think it would be the end of it. Uh, but we definitely need input. I think the idea of having the Brown Act, I don't <laughs> know, it, but the problem with just going with the subcommittee, you don't get the public input, which is part of the recommendation from mm -hmm. the I can't read it. Part. Oh, sorry. Uh, one of the uh, one of the, rec the part of the recommendation was was to, to include additional community input, and if you just have a subcommittee and you're meeting with people here and there, yeah. it doesn't provide the opportunity for the public to be involved. That's so I think so you, we yeah. need public input. Yeah. So okay. Well, then let's just leave it as it is. And then what? We the agendize next meeting or something to do the appointments, or, um, or how do you do that? If you wanted, I mean, I think the agenda item is broad enough that if after the motion is adopted, if you wanted to appoint two members to serve on the ad hoc. Well, um, and before everybody jumps in, let's do it first and then see who wants to do it because um, let's. We have a motion and a second. So. We have a motion and a second, so let's call for the vote first. Okay, Vice Mayor Singleton. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Campion. Councilmember Cruz. Aye. Mayor Powers. Aye. Now, do we have any volunteers from the council that want to be on the committee? I would like to be on that committee if we, council is in agreement with that. I'll help them. Which one? Which one? Okay, oh, yeah. With everybody else, Good jump. Night. Okay. Uh, all right, then council members Cruz and Singleton will be on the committee. Well, we're on that subject, too, and I'm turning parts and record aware of it. Don't we have a dog park planned uh, as part of Walker Park? Isn't there one at the south end? No, I think it was moved yeah. to the northeast side. Northeast at one point, it was discussed. Right. Oh, okay. I, my understanding is it was it was moved to the other park on the northeast because that one was going to go first, and people right. didn't want to wait until the build out of Walker, Walker Park. So I thought the master plan. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Okay. Well, it's just an idea. It could be. It is. It is a potential there. site on the west side. Uh, just to information. Okay, let's get to the information and consent calendar. Liz, could you please read five items? Yes, number one, approval of minutes of the regular meeting of March 19th, 2013. Number two, approval of the City of Galt Warrants. Number three, a resolution terminating the Galt Middle School Joint Powers Agreement. Number four, a resolution terminating the Public Financing Authority Joint Powers Agreement. And number five, approval of the Treasurer's Report for the period ending February 2013. Move to accept consent. Second. Is there any further discussion? Call for the vote, please, Liz. Vice Mayor Singleton? Aye. Councilmember Payne? Aye. Councilmember Campion? Aye. Councilmember Cruz? Aye. Mayor Powers? Aye. Okay, City Manager's Office, the Softcom License Agreement. <clears throat> That's me. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. It's my pleasure to present this item for you this evening. Uh, the City of Galt currently leases space on the Old Town Water Tower to Softcom Internet Communications. Uh, the original five-year lease was executed in February of 2005 in the amount of $1,500 per month, and it's adjusted annually according to CPI. It's been extended since that time, and the current agreement expires in February of 2015. Uh, the current uh, monthly least amount of 18.24.83 cents. Um, in 2012, Softcom completed construction of a 195-foot tower at its new corporate headquarters within the city limits on Industrial Drive. Upon completion of the tower, installation of various equipment and antennas, Softcom advised the city that it no longer had had the same need for the antenna and equipment up on top of the water tower, and um, uh, Softcom was was interested in renegotiating the lease with the city. Further, they indicated that the current lease agreement they had with the city was uh, much higher than the lease that they currently had with other um, tower providers within, within the region. In February of 2013, the city received a, a formal notice from Softcom uh, notifying the city they were exercising their right under the agreement to cancel the agreement within 30 days notice, which is under Section 9B which states that the lessee can, that determines that the premises are not appropriate for its operations for economic, environmental, technological reasons. Um, nevertheless, Softcom was, uh, did indicate that they were interested and willing to um, entertain or renegotiate, re-enter into a contract with the city for um, an extension of the lease agreement or the license agreement for their equipment up on top of the water tower. 
Um, accordingly, staff uh, negotiated with Softcom and came to a uh, tentative agreement with a rental amount of $833 per month. Softcom provided some additional copies of lease agreements with other tower providers in the region um, showing a lease amount that was comparable or less than the amount that they negotiated with the city. Uh, the agreement presented to the council this evening is for five years and allows either Softcom or the city to terminate license uh, with upon 90 days notice. Um, the agreement also includes a $20 per month increase per year. The agreement also allows um, the city to lay, lease space on the tower to other cellular service providers as long as the other users do not interfere with Softcom's operations. So staff has been contacting other cellular companies to find out if there's an interest in, in uh, entering into an agreement or siting cellular equipment on the tower. Up to this point, we have not received any express interest in, in doing that, but we'll continue to reach out and see if we can maximize the use of the tower space and get the rental income back up to where it was uh, previously. The current lease agreement generates approximately $21,898 for the city's general fund. Historically, the city has contributed $10,000 of this amount to the Galt Area Historical Society for the restoration of McFarland Ranch. In 2012, the council voted to implement a new process that allowed local nonprofits to compete for this $10,000 beginning this year. The grant solicitation and application process is cur currently underway, and we expect to be back to the council, I believe, at the next meeting or possibly in May. Uh, with some with with the applications for the council to consider um, how to distribute the ten thousand dollars in the current year budget, the new license agreement will generate approximately just less than ten thousand dollars in annual revenue in the first year, and, and after that it'll go up. Um, that's a decrease of approximately eleven thousand dollars, nine hundred two dollars from the current lease, which re re results in a reduction in the current fiscal year of almost four thousand dollars. And then next year, it would be um, approximately a reduction of $12,000. Um, and that reduction will be reflected in the upcoming budget process. We're just in the process of, uh, of implementing or bringing it back to the council in May. Uh, the, the new rent amount is sufficient to continue to fund the city's nonprofit funding program, if the council so desires, but result, would result in a net loss to the city's general fund. Um, by by that amount, the 12,000 or the 11,902. Uh, staff is hopeful that the reduction could be recovered through future revenue through a new lease license agreement with a cellular company, but this time we do not have any leads and there's been no express interest. Um, there is the alternative is the council could not authorize the city manager to execute the new agreement with Softcom. This option is not recommended as Softcom would then exercise its right to terminate the agreement and the city would get no funds um, from that licensing agreement. So the staff recommendation is that the city council adopt the resolution authorizing the city manager to execute the license agreement with Softcom Internet Communications. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Questions, council? Comments? Okay, you can see. I see. Wait, wait. Meeting. <clears throat> so, if I understand correctly, <clears throat> we're get, it's generating basically nine thousand nine hundred dollars to us, whereas before it was twenty-one thousand. And with this, we'd be taking a four thousand dollar cut in the general fund. That's well. That's just for this year, but this year. on an annual basis, you would be taking about twelve thousand dollars, a twelve thousand dollar hit. That is, if we don't find someone else to take it, correct? True. Okay. Um, and that's if you continue to give um, all of the, the, the revenue or the $10,000 to a nonprofit group. And if we didn't, then and that money would. Right now, right now, we, the, the city um, gives 10000 to the non nonprofit, the remaining 11900 goes to the city. So if we decided not, the council decided not to give to the nonprofit, then the city would get the whole 10000 so then the city would only be out $1,900. Okay, the question I'm, I guess I'm posing here is, I'm all for taking care of our nonprofits. It's a high priority, but not at the expense of the, the city as itself, or the running of the city. So if you can find someone who would be able to replenish that, then we can go ahead and kick it back in. I have no issue with that. But it makes no sense to me for us to start off with a $4,000 deficit and then go further down the line as we go down each year. 
that, that's based on <laughs> budget now, correct? What's projected based on the current budget? What, what do you mean? Well, the four thousand dollars deficit that he's that's just this budget. year. Yeah, that's the current fiscal year because we we budgeted for you know the the twenty one thousand dollars to come in this year. The new agreement takes effect uh, would take effect March one, and so the first you know, um, month through through March, we have the higher rent, and then from March through June, would be at the lower rent, and so we'd be we'd be missing out on the three thousand nine hundred dollars, three hundred nine hundred and three thousand nine hundred sixty-seven dollars, um, based on the action tonight. But, but this current fiscal year, we still have ten thousand dollars. We're going to be doling out. Is that correct? We have ten thousand dollars budgeted in the in the current year. Okay. So essentially, the, uh, the amount of money that we were going to be getting originally was going to be about twenty-one thousand mm -hmm. dollars. We're going to be getting about seventeen thousand dollars this year. So, what type of hit are we taking on the general fund? So, if we get the full ten thousand, then the city would get seven thousand, and we'd be normally we'd get eleven thousand. So we're taking a four thousand hit. dollar hit. Right. That's on your revenue side. But it doesn't right. mean that you expended that amount, right? I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's four thousand dollars on. It's revenue. How big's the, how big's the general fund budget? Right. I mean, that's huge. Is it yeah. money it's been budgeted yeah. for? Yeah. yeah. It's. Uh, I, what, I don't know that that is real significant. Um, at the end, of, at the year end, when they go and balance the general fund, some people have spent less, some people have spent more. Inez is always conservative. Her revenues always seem to come in higher. So I mean, it's it's a really a balancing act. I don't know that four thousand dollars is something you could say that it's going to be. I don't think it a is. Deficit. Yeah, I don't it's think it's. On the budget. I don't think it is this year, but I'm. Uh, it, uh, next year, eleven grand is a big hit. And like like I said, that's if you can't find someone else to take the, the spot on the tower. Thank you. Well, I come from a nonprofit, and I understand both sides of the coin. But um, I have seen some of the things that the city has had to take. So I personally, being in the spot right here, uh, it's four grand this year, as Kurt says, is really not a lot. But I think in the future, if we don't get someone, it's important that we, you know, keep our funding to ourselves. So what what we can do is. Liz is going to be bringing forth the current year allocation of the $10,000, and the council can decide how it wants to distribute that money, or if it wants to distribute that money at that, that meeting. Um, and then when we have our budget works, workshop on May 28th, when we go through the budget and, and allocation, we'll identify that $10,000 for next year, and the council can decide at that point whether it wants to allocate the $10,000 or anything less than $10,000 or more than $10,000 for the nonprofit program for 2014. More would be nice. But so what are you asking for tonight, then? All we're asking for tonight is that you adopt the agreement. Okay. You approve the agreement. That's right, not the... No, we'll bring back the funding no, stuff right. later. I move we accept the agreement. Second. Any more further discussion, Council? Call for the vote, please, Liz. Vice Mayor Singleton? Aye. Councilmember Payne? Aye. Councilmember Campion? Aye. Councilmember Cruz? Aye. Mayor Powers? Aye. Now we're at the City Attorney's Office. An ordinance amending Chapter 19.12 of the Galt Municipal Code regarding floodplain management. Steve. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, last December, the City Council adopted an ordinance which replaced Title IX of the Municipal Code relating to floodplain management. And Title 19 has six uh, separate chapters. And within one of the chapters, Chapter 19.12, uh, this chapter contains some general provisions, including some uh, enforcement provisions, and there were some uh, typographical errors in one section, section 1912040, had some extraneous language, and also at several points, instead of referring to uh, the title, it made reference to the chapter. So this is a uh, minor cleanup ordinance to correct those, those errors, which is presented for your consideration tonight. Council, any questions? So moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Call for the vote, please, Liz. Vice Mayor Singleton. 
Aye. Councilmember Payne? Aye. Councilmember Campion? Aye. Councilmember Cruz? Aye. Mayor Powers? Aye. We've already done number three, the uh, Memorial Dog Park. So, um, Armando, we're going to have the follow up on rental of Chibola and Littleton Community Centers to resident nonprofit organizations. Good evening again, uh, Mayor and Council. At the February 5th Council meeting, Council approved resolution uh, 2013. 04, which allows resident nonprofit organizations to rent the Littleton and Shibola community centers once per calendar year at no cost but required organizations to pay a $150 cleaning deposit, limited advance reservations to one year in advance, and abide by special provisions. City Council also requested staff to return with the following information. Clarify Scouts' use of facilities, how many of the 18 rentals February 12th through uh, year, excuse me, February 2012 through January 2013 were events versus fundraisers, categorized types of nonprofits and their past usage for the different fee structure, options for a refrigerator at Shibola Community Center. Attachment 2 of your packet clarifies the use of the community center facilities by the Boy Scouts and other nonprofits for 2011, 12, and 13 up through March uh, 27th. It shows the number of events and which events were fundraisers versus events. In 2011, we had 10 out of the 22 um, rentals that were fundraisers. 2012, 12 of the 18 were fundraisers. And in 2013, 9 of the 14, 14 were fundraisers. Attachment 3 of the packet shows the organizational charge for Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. These organizations are broken down at the local level to what are called PACs, DANs, or troops. Under, under the current rental policy that the Parks and Rec Department considers each PAC, DAN, troop their own separate nonprofit. So basically, if troop PAC 84 rented the facility one time, we're not counting that against any other PAC within the, in the city. Um, Council may provide direction to staff if they would like them to, cons to be considered differently. Otherwise, staff will continue to enforce the policy as they have in the past. Council may also take into consideration the type of events that the nonprofit organizations are having, fundraiser versus event, and provide direction to staff. Regarding the option of the commercial refrigerator at the Shibola Center, staff has been in contact with Meals on Wheels in Sacramento and they are able to provide us a second commercial refrigerator at no cost for the Meals and Wheels program, which we will now store in the freezer room um, where we have other equipment for Meals and Wheels. So that takes care of that uh, issue. So we now have an uh, open refrigerator for events held at the Shibola Center. Good so job. I, I believe I've answered yeah. your uh, follow-up questions. And uh, if you have any other questions, I'll be glad to answer them. That's Council? Well done, Armando. Very well done. Thank you. I like the, um, we had a big discussion last time, but I do like the fact that uh, I don't think what it's for, but one a year, as uh, actually Jason said, uh, I think it's good one a year for, so we don't have to split hairs about what they're doing or, you know, and if they want to have two or three, they can figure out which of the one is the best one to have. That's that's my thought. Anybody else? Isn't that what where we are now? Uh, he had brought that back next time about one free free. That's Before it was two. Right. right. That's what's already been approved. So if the council doesn't want to make any changes to that, then and you're good. This was just informational. If okay. you wanted to make any changes, then uh, you could you could request that of staff. I do have one question real quick. How how long are we already got the uh, industrial refrigerator in place? It'll be in place by the end of April, by the end of this month. So we could be renting it by beginning of June, July, or May? Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. I thought when we last discussed this, one of the concerns was is that, that, at least for me it was, the underlying purpose. Like with the Boy Scouts and so forth, for everyone that they have identified here it was a non-fundraiser issue, I don't have a problem to leave it as it is. But for those that are actually doing fundraising, I think we should go back to whatever the rate was before we made this, or whenever the council made the change, whatever that charge was. I mean, that, that was what my issue was, or that I thought uh, was most appropriate at the last discussion. 
So I don't know, and that's one thing that's not included in here. In the prior report, didn't we have what the rates were for uh, rentals? I'm not sure. Do you know what the rental the rates are? I I don't believe they they were. I I believe we still have that that fee in place, but and that is for um, before this year for the third fourth event, and it would be applied to any of their second and third ones since this has been approved. I, I believe it's four hundred dollars a day. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, that's not four hundred dollars. I see. So, what, what the council is saying that all nonprofits here get one per year, regardless of its fundraiser or not. Is it, that's the way. It, that's it, the way it is right that's now. That's the way it is yeah. now. I guess that's what you did in the March meeting when when you discussed it. Mm -hmm. Council vo uh, voted to to take it to, from two to one. Right. And it doesn't matter what it was for. You see, one time a year. And I think we extended. You could reserve up to one year in advance because before you could only do it six months in advance. That's correct. Right. And a lot of the groups right. wanted to be able to re reserve their next event. You know, a year a year in advance, and so we made, the council made that change. I guess they misunderstood because I thought the fundraising portion was exempt from that. And they still had to pay for that. No, it's it's one free rental, regardless if it's an, a fundraiser or an event. Um, you could give direction to staff to, if uh, council decides to, to change that. But resolution uh, 201304 is attached. That is what was passed at the last at that meeting. Is if you wanted to exclude fundraising events and let and make them pay for the cost of the facility, then we would have to come back and revise that resolution. Well, I don't want to change it because one fundraising event a year. I mean, every, a lot of the nonprofits are struggling, and not only that, but a lot of the nonprofits, the money comes back, back, back to the community, to the community so, yeah. and donations. For parks and things like that. Right. Speaking of parks. Speaking of parks. <laughs> so I guess my comment would be I'm fine with leaving it as it is. I don't know if you need a motion to that effect or yeah, you need I'm a fine. consensus or. You don't need a motion to leave it the way it is <clears throat> unless there's a motion to, uh, to make a change and you could go on to the next item. Okay. All right, we're going to go to the next item then. Public Works Department, the capital improvement program status updated from January to March 31st, 2013. Mr. Winkler. Well, somehow it's fitting that we talk some more about infrastructure. So uh, this is a quarterly update on your capital improvement program, which is primarily infrastructure uh, capital spending <coughs> um, or for capital maintenance needs. Um, uh, this is a pretty conventional quarterly report. We have eight completed projects since July 1 of 2012 uh, through the current quarter uh, ending uh, March 30th. And um, we're pleased to add to that list of eight, uh, or the eighth item is we're now declaring Central Vault Interchange current phase complete. We're still doing project closeout. That'll actually take a couple of months with Caltrans to get the maintenance agreements and transitioning the signal signals to Caltrans control. There's a few punch list items, but substantially the project is now complete. We're trying to close that project out. Uh, however, uh, uh, in the, the third category of uh, design phase, we're actually working on the first phase for landscaping for that. Uh, we have three active projects currently under construction uh, for which contracts have been awarded in the past. And we're projecting that all three of those will be complete uh, by June or a fourth quarter report. Um, and uh, uh, notably on our sort of pending in the design environmental bid phase, uh, we uh, have received bids for the fiber optic line, which will be some data connectivity to enhance uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, communication systems, which will help our, our commonly known as SCADA, and don't ask me to tell you what that five-letter acronym stands for, but it's basically uh, data transmission and communication, external communication capabilities uh, to, to monitor plan operations and actually make remote changes as needed. Um, and uh, we're on a very slow, congested, uh, sort of a, a limited a bandwidth uh, hardwire line right now, and uh, this, this expansion project uh, will help us to facilitate that. Unfortunately, bids came in higher than existing funding, so we've uh, uh, had a meeting this past week uh, in the city manager's office to uh, look at how we might uh, transfer some additional funds uh, to cover that project. Uh, uh, it's still necessary and it'll actually provide some, some benefits citywide uh, 
uh, virtually all city departments in one way or another use that data link, and if we can improve that, uh, um, uh, that will be an asset to the city. So we're going to have your recommendation, bringing back a recommendation to you in a couple of weeks uh, to award that and where that additional funding will come from. We're also uh, out to bid on the E Street lift station, and just today, uh, went out to bid on the Twin Cities Roundabouts project, and uh, we'll probably be doing it uh, if all if the best laid plans come together here. Uh, we'll be issuing an addendum to that here in the next several weeks uh, uh, for the to add the Twin Cities widening phase. But we're still closing out some final plan details and Caltrans and county review uh, for that aspect. So we wanted to get the the major project out to bid, and we got an extended bid opportunity that allow us to chase that with an addendum for the widening project as well, which of course would be to help facilitate the future Walmart construction. So we're excited about that. With that, any questions on the report, I'd be happy to try to answer that. Council, any questions? Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, we're going to um, adjourn the Galt City Council and convene to the Galt Successor Agency. Roll call, please. This board members Singleton here. Kane here. Campion here. Bruce here. Howard here. Any public comment? I have no speaker sheet. Okay. Uh, information consent agenda. The minutes of the meeting of March 19, 2013, and City of Galt warrants. Do I have a motion? Move. Accept. Move and seconded. Call for the vote list. Board members Singleton? Aye. Payne? Aye. Campion? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Powers? Aye. Okay, I'm going to adjourn the Gulf Successor Agency and reconvene to the Gulf City Council meeting, and we're at the City Clerk's report. Just a couple reminders. I can find it. Our shredded event is April 7th out at the Gulf Market Grounds from 9 to 1, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And everyone can bring up to three file boxes or a couple garbage bags full of anything you need to shred or need shredded to shred. So come on up to the Galt Market Grounds. On April 10th, the Parks and Rec Commission meeting will be held at 7 p.m. in the Council Chambers. There will be a joint City Council and Planning Commission meeting on April 11th at 6.30 here in the Council Chambers. That takes us to our next Council meeting on April 16th. Just a reminder, I'm kind of skipping some things, but it was not on the calendar. On April 24th, we will have a measure or committee. It will be on our next calendar. Okay. Okay. That's it, Liz. Okay. okay. Comments by staff? Over here, over there, over here. I have one. I just wanted to add an event on May 4th, the uh, Cherokee Cool Truck Show. We'll be having their event. And the reason I mention this event is because they're 99% of our uh, scholarship donation fund. Uh, they they also give to the Shriners Club. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make sure you guys knew that that was coming up. It was in the paper this last week. So if you guys could uh, stop by and say hi to Bob. Bob's a great guy and uh, donates all the money that he, he makes. He, they are a very good group and, and we're glad to have them back. Uh, any more staff? Just to make a mention, uh, your department heads had a good workshop last Friday. Did some team building, talked about succession planning, all kinds of different uh, topics. So, um, but you, you have a much more cohesive team now as uh, your executive management team. So, looking forward to taking some of the suggestions and recommendations, things that came out of that, and implementing them within each of the departments moving forward, and just always continually look for ways to improve the, the team and deliver the best services for the community. Good, thank you. And, any more staff? Okay, I'm going to start with Council Member Campion today because I, I almost forgot. I almost forgot. No, no, no. <laughs> you have nothing. Nothing. Oh, you kidding? You don't have anything. Council Member Cruz. You guys are going to hate me. I just I'm not sitting well with G4 right now. With what? I'm sorry. G4, the the issue regarding Littleton and, and Chabola. Um, do I need to bring this up at the next meeting? Or are we still active? Um, have to place it on the agenda. Okay. Can, you to, can you revisit that? Can I revisit that item? Mm -hmm. That is what I'd like to do. Well, I'm sorry, but I say no. 
I think he should. I think he should be able to discuss it. Well, we just did, though, didn't we? I know, but he obviously has something he wants to oh, talk okay. about. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm a yes. No. Council Member Singleton. I don't care either way. If we need to discuss it, then I think we should discuss it. But I was happy as what. That's why we we got <coughs> past it. So when we did last month. So I'm going to say no too. So, but it's three to three to two. So I guess it's coming back. Thank you. Anybody else want to bring anything else back? Okay, Barbara, to you. To me. To you. Okay, uh, reporting on the Sacramento Public Library Library Authority. Um, it's in a very serious situation. Uh, they're looking at possibly having to close for uh, libraries in the city of Sacramento. Right now, golf is, is OK. Uh, and they may be able to recover. They've got some plans, but uh, it is serious. The other thing is uh, April 14th through April 20th is National Library Week. So uh, that week, go out and Hug your library. <laughs> or your librarian or something. Huh? Yeah, I don't know. You need a clap in your <laughs> or a book. Uh -huh. so, there you go. That's okay. it. Council Member Singleton? Um, you didn't say anything about the extravaganza. I'm going to let you do it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you're supposed to compliment me. Uh, oh. I was going to. <laughs> but not to so I won't. No. Oh. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I did. Uh, we, we attended, uh, as uh, Mayor was out there also with Mayor Powers, and uh, Attended the uh, extravaganza and uh, what a lot of fun! I was, I was so nice to see. We had, it was quite a crowd. Did they consider that a pretty good crowd? Because I thought it was a pretty good crowd. Double. It was almost yeah. double. It was great. And in fact, uh, yeah, that's right. Miss Camping was out there, and uh, we watched a little pie eating contest. And Channel 31 was out there. It was a lot of fun. It was it was really good to see everybody out there. It was one of our, uh, I think, better days of uh, before the rains came in. Uh, got lucky with that, and uh, I just really enjoyed myself. And I want to. Done by thank you to the uh, shop, uh, shop local folks and uh, and for setting that up. They did a great job. Mm -hmm. All right. And I wanted to kind of reiterate that I had a really good time. It was a lot of fun. Um, there were a lot of people out there. We got to talk to a lot of people, and I was very proud that everybody in the city council showed up there. And I think we all had a really really good time. So now I'd like to talk about our next event, the Fourth of July. This uh, week, I'd like to bring up uh, at the Chibola Center, we're going to have uh, an old time county fair. So if you know anyone that uh, has pickled things or jams, baked goods, or quilts, uh, tell them that we, you know, we have prizes. And it's really a lot of fun. Last year, we had more than we thought we were going to have. And we've got two people working on this committee. And I think it's going to be really good this year. But we need to get the word out. So tell everyone you know that does that fun stuff to please remember us for the 4th of July. Hmm. Steve? Uh -huh. uh, Mayor, it's, uh, sorry, it took me a moment to find this, but in your uh, City Council procedural guidelines, you do have a rule relating to reconsideration. It's Rule 4.8.8. .8, and it says, motions for reconsideration of a matter may only be made at the same meeting at which the City Council takes action on a matter. So um, if a member of the council wanted to make a motion for reconsideration at this point, if that motion passes, you can reconsider that item um, at this meeting. So if you wanted to reconsider uh, the resolution relating to the, um, the rental of the uh, uh, Chabola Center and the Littleton Center to nonprofits, you can, in fact, uh, recon upon the adoption of a motion for reconsideration, go back to that item this evening. OK, then if you go back to that item, do you discuss what he wants to discuss, and then we vote? So then it will be over with today, tonight? Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, well then. So for, the way to move on that would be for somebody to make a motion for reconsideration I of item G4. I, I second. One, two, three, do I have a motion? Uh, do I have a roll call? Sorry. Vice Mayor Singleton? Uh, aye. Council Member Payne? Aye. 
Council Member Fenton, Council Member Cruz, Aye. Mayor Powers. Aye. Thank you. I, I beg your indulgence on this. I just I've been, I've been approached by several different groups, and the more I think about it, the more it's like I said, I misunderstood the portion about the the groups making money versus just meet a meeting place. I would like the council to consider the following. A lot of these groups, especially in your scouting organizations, the Cub Scouts in particular, have a major event once a year. That event being their blue and gold. As well as that, they have things like their ring, ring gutter regatta and things of that nature where they need a place to meet. And I'm just using this example because other groups I know, Lions Club and so forth, have the same thing. What I'm looking at is possibly, and bear with me, allowing them two a year as long as the two are not for Fund fundraisers. If they are for fundraisers, then of course they follow the same criteria as everyone else. So I don't know how we'd go about wording one. I, and I, I don't disagree with you, but I'm, when, I, when I look through this list, I don't see where the, you said the rain gutter regatta. Uh, I don't see that in here. I'll use this as an example. I think it oh, was. Okay. The scouts use the schools a lot, too. Yeah. They're not just using our facilities. So sometimes they have those events at the various local schools. But now that we have two facilities that are 100% usable, in other words, we have refrigeration at both, we have cooking facilities at both, we've now opened things up a little bit so we're not going to be shorting people if we need to rent, that, rent out the facilities. And Armando, I'm looking to you for input on this as well, if you think it's going to be a situation where it's going to cause you to lose revenue. Well, that was, go ahead. It, if, if we could limit them to the Shibola Center uh, and... Or not on the weekend. Or, or not, on, not on Saturdays. And that's one of the reasons that I had listed the days of the weeks so of the rentals. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could see when they are renting it. If you could restrict them to, for the events, mm -hmm. to, be, to use Shibola and not to use it on Saturdays, I, I think it would be fine if that's something that council wanted to do. Could we word it in that, ma in that manner so that it's during a weekday versus a weekend if they, like, they want to use it? So are we talking about any group? It would have to be up across the board because that would be the only thing to be fair. But like I said, two times, one could be on a weekend like, as we, uh, that's, we currently have it set, correct? It's one time and it's any one time, time any day of the week. But, but last year, it was twice. It was twice a year, um, any time right. for any. So what we're saying is, it'd be a one for one. One time, any time during during the week. The second time would only be during the week period. And it couldn't be for a fundraiser. Could be. Well, no. The two the two freebies are non fundraisers. If they're using it for a fundraiser, then they're going to have to pay. So, for example, if you wanted the scouts to have their blue and gold dinner and the Pinewood Derby. Then they and they can also have a fundraiser if they want to pay for the fundraiser. Yes, okay. but if they wanted two nonprofit events, as in say one night they have the Pinewood Derby and say three months down the road they have the Blue and Gold, I don't have an issue with that as long as like you're saying it's during the week and not on the weekend. Well, no, because what we just said was, you know, sometimes fundraising is for a, a group to get give back to the community. I mean, when the Lions fundraise. It's, to you know, money for eyeglasses. So here we go again of trying to figure out how to make it all work. When and it sounds like you're you're asking to increase the availability of the facilities. Well, that was the reason. You're going to two instead of one. Well, but one could only be during the week. Is that what you're correct. saying? Correct. And do you have a problem with during the week? Do you have a lot. You see in front of you what we've done in the last few years. In 2011, we didn't have any restrictions or there were no free rentals. Um, I mean, it would just be up to availability of the center. I mean, there, there will be additional costs for janitorial supplies, um, possible cleaning, but the $150 deposit should cover those costs should they occur. If, if the uh, first priority was the excuse me, Mr. Campion, if you. the first priority was the Shibuya Center, as I recall from the first report, wouldn't Littleton seems to generate more revenue, correct? If they're paying customers, 
well, Littleton's can be reserved by the public. So right. you can have a private party there where right. they can't have one at Shibola. So if you have them just at Shibola, it opens up more dates at Littleton to be reserved or to be rented by a private party. Is there any, any consideration given to, to limiting the, the, the free usage to Shibola only? And if they want to pay like any other member of the public, that then they could pay for Littleton. I mean, that, that's another alternative, particularly if they've got the refrigeration units there. That would be a good idea. I'm thinking at the council meeting where this came up before, we had a speaker from the scout, and they seemed to indicate that the Littleton, they needed the size of the Littleton for their event. Anything that's associated with scouting, I don't have a problem with, quite frankly, giving them a pass. I kind of agree with uh, Councilman Cruz. But again, as you mentioned, we we have to be fair. Understand. I'm fine with I'm fine with what we have proposed with once a year, and I know even if we have a cleaning uh, fee, and because uh, I've been involved as many of us have with a lot of events, it seems like the staff, even if we put up the tables and do all that, the staff is still there. Yeah. And it's 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 a um, it's still a drain on the staff, even if the nonprofit promises to mop and put up. I still see staff members running around trying to help, and I think um, I think it's, it would be harder for them to do it instead of everybody having one time a year to double it regardless of if it's nonprofit or if it's for profit. I just think it's going to be, I think we're being generous now, and I think to increase it to twice a year, I think it's going to be You're doubling the diff problems yeah, difficult for, for us to afford it, to be honest. And this yeah. does add extra staff stress, is that not correct? Uh, that is <laughs> that Steve Winkler staff, that's but may, may I also add that for every event, whether it's a fundraiser or just an event, there's still a pre-inspection and post-inspection right. of the event. Staff still has to be scheduled to come and close and or open up. the facility. Yeah. And I would direct the other qu that question to Steve. He's thanking you with his eyes. <laughs> I don't know about stress. There is an added cost. Uh, yeah. We have to be there. We have to open up. We have to close up with. Uh, well, stress as far as staff is you got to schedule somebody to be there to, to lock it up. Uh, you know, you might tell them 11 o'clock, and sometimes they're not out of there 11, that kind of thing. There's an added cost. Yeah, that's all we need to know. Because uh, that was your question, correct? Yeah. Okay, well, I guess it's to you, Council Member Cruz, if you want to make a motion and see what happens with it. That's all I can say, correct? Correct. Well, I'm going to run over anyway. I make motion that we increase the number of days to two for nonprofits, and that they be the two being limited to the Chiboya Center. The second week, or the second second one being during the weekdays. Do I have a second? Okay, the motion dies for lack of a second. I just, I just didn't quite understand that, Mark. I'm sorry. The second time around, it would be during the weekday, not during, not the, during the week. week. Correct. Okay, do we have a second? So then the motion dies, correct? Okay, and with that, time to adjourn the meeting.